Hello everyone, welcome back to The Lonely Artist. I'm your host, Ariane, and today I have a very special guest with me, Tanaya, a dear friend and an amazing artist. So welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks, Ariane. I'm so excited to be here. You're so, so sweet to have me on. <laughs> and honestly, this is an interview that I've been wanting to do for a while because I mean, we've known each other for a bit and I just have so many questions that I just, I want you to answer. <laughs> oh, well, I can answer them, but I can't guarantee that I'll answer them well. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll answer them at length and there might be like a good nugget in there somewhere. Nice. Well, well, we'll give it a go and see how it goes. I'm sure there's a lot <laughs> of wisdom behind that brain of yours. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and where your art journey began? So my name is Tanaya. Um, I am currently um, doing freelance storyboards for animation and working on a web comic called Bad Witches, which is on Webtoons. Um, and I'm also writing, um, hopefully going to be querying novels by the end of the year. I write um, contemporary fantasy. Nice. Yeah, so that's kind of, yeah, that's what I'm doing now. It's been really exciting. Um, the transition to freelance is recent for me and it's to give me some time to work on some like my own projects and independent stuff. Um, so that's been really awesome um, and a, a really fun and interesting adjustment. Um, but I would say I've always been, I mean, everyone says this, but I've always been into arts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I probably, I don't know if I would call myself an artist strictly. I would probably like call myself a storyteller. Um, I really like art, but art to me is a medium and like storyteller is what I am. Um, so I write as well. So sometimes prose is my medium, sometimes drawing is my medium. Um, but I just really think stories are the heart of it um, and are so fascinating. And I feel incredibly lucky that that's what I get to do. I love that you say that because I definitely feel that from you, like you're a storyteller first and foremost in however way yeah. you can express it. I mean, it does matter, but maybe not as much as just getting that story out there, right, into the world. And your stories are great. They're very entertaining. Oh, yes. and. <laughs> They're captivating, so that's that's a, a bonus for sure. <laughs> yeah, and that's like, right, like different people have totally different approaches to art and stuff. So I think knowing what kind of artist you are is really like good and important because it allows you to lean into your strengths. And for me, that's definitely a story. So the animation industry is interesting. I'm a storyboard artist. Um, the last full-time job I had was on the Baby Shark movie. Woo woo, baby. Shark Aren't you glad I didn't do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you ruined it, no. <laughs> um, so that's coming out this fall, which is really cool. Um, but it, this is the first time that I've been, had a long stretch where I'm independent. So I've done some um, like freelance and some small work, but um, I'm not taking anything full-time in boards at the moment to be able to split up my time a little more between my different creative pursuits. Um, and that's been really exciting and freeing. Like, I love animation, but I think almost everybody who got into that kind of thing did it to create their own stuff. And so being able to have a little time to do that um, has been really great. And putting out Bad Witches is really cool for me because it's the first time that something that I've made start to finish has gone out into the world. So it's been really exciting and um, the response has been so good. It's really gratifying to see that people get my jokes. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is a... It is a transition, right? And I bet you yeah. don't really know what to expect, which can be yeah. exciting and also daunting. But how do you think that your work outside of comics and what you studied in college is contributing to now the work that you're putting out there into the comic book world? Yeah, um, I think that what I ended up doing is kind of like the it's like a, it's a tri section between two different things. It's what are you good at? what do you like and then what do you practice and so i think obviously animation having worked in animation and doing a lot of storyboarding means that um i just have a lot of practice in that area and i tend to use a lot of kind of storyboarding tips and tricks i like dynamic angles i like um detailed naturalistic acting um so i think that um that kind of like trifecta is where i ended up um so I tend to focus a lot on like character drawings um, and conveying emotion through uh, through physicality. Um, and I actually had not been like a humor artist or a humor writer in any way before I started working in animation. Um, and so I definitely would not have written this comic um, before I started working in animation. It's 
I, I got to dip my toes in the comedy water and then I was like, oh, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that trifecta sounds like a powerhouse. It's a bunch of skills that I bet a lot of people wish they had like coming into the world of uh, comics, but you already have it. So I feel like you're already one step ahead. And that is super cool because it's not an easy medium to share with the world for sure. And you have yeah. this like amazing set of skills that you already <laughs> bring with you to the table. You're so nice. Well, I will say this though, and it's not modesty, which is like everyone has something to learn and everybody has a different skill set. And I am like a firm believer of you should be excited and happy with the work that you produce at every stage. And so I don't think it gives me the only thing I would say that has ever given me a leg up is that I make a really concentrated effort to work on my mental health. And I think in this industry, that's like really important and um, is in some ways kind of the only thing that matters. Because if you practice and if you try, you will get better. You mm -hmm. will get good. You will get good at whatever you're doing if you just keep going at it. And so I think the more important thing is to figure out how to be happy and excited with like what you're making right now, regardless of your objective skill level. That's so important. And actually, I just noticed that mental health, while well, it's intertwined with the art world so much and with us as artists, yeah. I rarely ever talk about it on the podcast. So I'm really happy that you brought What? that up. <laughs> I really, uh, honestly, it's so weird that, I mean, There have been moments in several interviews where we've discussed it like lightly, but really is it something that that is pointed out as things that you should focus on the most in your creative pursuits, right? Because yeah, the art comes from the artist and their mental health and their emotional health, right? So it's yeah, for sure, extremely important. A hundred percent. And I don't think that means you need to be perky, happy. It doesn't even mean you have to be confident all the time. I think the biggest thing for me was like learning to not judge myself mm -hmm. because sometimes you make a good drawing. Sometimes you make bad drawing. Sometimes some days you're just better than others. And to be able to like put that out and not judge yourself is like so important. It's not about being some paragon of virtue. Like I'm a mess. We're a mess. You're all a mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like it's about learning to like just like let go of that because the amount of like time and mental energy that I used to spend um, worrying, feeling insecure, and then worrying about the fact that I was spending my energy feeling insecure. <laughs> the vicious <laughs> it's like, cycle. <laughs> it's a vicious cycle. It's like now that I feel a lot more like calm and centered, um, it's just really like changed my approach to, to life, but like to drawing, because I think all of the creative pursuits are intensely personal and um, that you just can't talk about them without talking about mental state, I think. Exactly. It's so true. And not even not even 20 minutes into the interview, you're already like dropping bombs of wisdom <laughs> <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> so sweet. Look, the police is coming for you. <laughs> oh no, they found me. <laughs> they realized that Bad Witches was actually my own story all along. Oh. <laughs> And, you know, talking about your comic, you, you do have a very distinct style. And I've always wondered if this is a conscious decision on your part or if this is something that developed naturally or maybe a combination of both things. Yeah, definitely a combination of both things. Um, I don't really think of it as being distinct because um, it's just <laughs> how I draw. <laughs> <laughs> But there's like two components to it. One is kind of like habit and like the kind of line work and the gesture itself is just innate to how I like to draw. And so I wanted to stick to that because for me, when I started Bad Witches, I was like, the most important thing to me is to be able to make this comic. Like, mm -hmm. hopefully it'll be good. Hopefully it'll be funny. Hopefully it'll be well received. But actually, that's not all of that is second to actually getting it done. And so I picked something that was close to my innate style because I knew that would keep me um, sped up and it wouldn't require me to do a ton of legwork in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, But I did make modifications to it. And part of that was I'm very, <laughs> I'm a little anal. I have <laughs> spreadsheets. And um, when I started out, I actually, I did the different steps in my process and I timed myself to see how much I could really produce in a week with the amount of hours that I had decided I could set aside for it. Um, and so certain things um, had to be sped up. So I picked a simpler color palette. It's a very limited palette. Um, and I decided not to go too heavy on the backgrounds because for me, I love backgrounds 
on other people's work, but, but for me, it wasn't what was going to add to this story. It wasn't what was important mm -hmm. about it. Um, and so I did make some very conscious decisions about like what to let go of. Um, and that was all for me really productivity and time driven because I think it's more important to get the story out there than for it to be perfect. Oh, for sure. I fully support that, honestly. And <laughs> <laughs> like all, all of that thought process behind the comic is, is I think, I recommend for people to have a an anal approach to it because yeah. a lot of people don't realize like the the amount of work that it requires and so yeah. this is one of the things that I'm saying that is lovely that you came into it knowing from a different industry uh, that yeah. you could apply it to comics because when you're an illustrator for for example you could spend hours on a single <laughs> illustration, right? And, and for coming from that to comics, it's yeah. like a smack in the face. <laughs> yeah. Whereas from animation, yeah. I feel like it really translates well to the world of comics. Yeah, for storyboards especially, I think, because like I'm used to working at a pace, I'm used to drafting really quickly, and I'm used to having to like manage kind of intense time schedules mm -hmm. because there are times in animation where I did, I wouldn't have a check-in with my director for three weeks and you just had to be on top of your own work. So yeah. I got used to breaking down my time um, daily and sometimes even by the half day if it was like a really tight deadline to make sure that I wasn't going to be off track. Back to mental health, I'm one of those people who is very achievement oriented and I'm not very good at remembering to celebrate my wins but also like um, look back on what I did well. So one of the things that I did when I went freelance and became my own boss um, was that I realized I needed to integrate some of that structure because I was moving from a place of basically a network of approvals where you turn something in, you get notes back, you turn it in again, and it gets approved and goes up the process. So there's an inherent mm. structure of you did a good job because it got approved, basically. Um, and also all my directors have been lovely and encouraging. Um, but I was like, oh, like, I'm not going to get any of that, like, positive feedback or validation, which I think is really important for people unless I give it to myself. Um, so I ended up building it into my structure. So every morning before I, I before I start work, um, I have a little journaling. I meditate and I journal. And one of the things that I journal is um, all the things that I'm proud of. And then at the end of the day, I journal all my achievements out. And I know it sounds like dumb and woo-woo or whatever, but first of all, there's science behind it. And second of all, <laughs> actually writing them down, the power of actually looking back and seeing all the stuff that you achieved, it's just a really like nice feeling, especially if you're someone who's goal-oriented like me. I actually think that's amazing. I think I, I admire <laughs> that about you. And I it's one of the few things that I've been working on this year as well myself. Like having a gratitude list and like really seeing tangible evidence of that effort because if you don't give that to yourself nobody else is going to <laughs> yeah exactly and it's even harder i think in something like comics or independent work where the kind of like goals and success is so nebulous like how do you measure that what do you right. what does like success look like for you so mm -hmm. figuring out how to build it out yourself because there's no like set number of followers and there's no number of set number of likes or set number of comments that like made you successful you have to set your own benchmarks and get excited about them yourself so i think that's like really good to do intentionally you talked about what success looks like you know and it looks different to everybody and I do want to circle back to that because it was not in the questions that I listed for me to <laughs> ask you but I am very curious uh, but before I ask you that one of the questions that I really wanted to ask you because I haven't asked you this and we've been talking for a long time now and I was saving that question for the interview Ooh. was how did you come up with bat witches Oh, that's a great question. Um, it wasn't like I had a magical epiphany moment. Um, I So I've been writing novels as well, and I wrote my first novel that I went to pitch, and um, I realized that uh, I had written in a really crowded genre, and it wasn't unique enough to stand out. It wasn't a bad novel. Mm -hmm. I actually think it was pretty good. Um, but it just didn't have a good hook. And so ever since having that happen, I've been like very aware of like needing to be able to sell your idea in a sentence or two in a way that's compelling. Um, and that was something that I like went into very intentionally with Bad Witches. I was like, I have to be able to like say this in two sentences and people will think it's funny and understand it. Um, that's a so very interesting, different story. approach from what usually people tell me about their comics. So sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. 
No, it's very different. I'm a little bit like, um, I I'm, can be quite business oriented and which isn't to say that I'm not passionate about my stories, but like, I think there's a million stories I could tell and be excited about. So I do try to be a little conscientious about what I'm starting and, um, whether it's a good idea or not. Um, so I started it out, like I start all of my projects out writing or art, which is a tone. Um, like, what is this kind of like? And I often think of like comps or like just basically a tone. Like, what is it comedy or or, or drama? Those are two very different um, genres and they're going to, you're, what you're going to make in each is very different. So I decided I want to do it comedy. I wanted it to be a dark comedy um, because as much as I love animation, I wanted to make something that was like a little more adult. Love that. Um, so <laughs> we got a little edgy. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and I wanted it to be... Um, feminist in a way that was non-judgmental okay um I love that. and i just love i love fantasy so i'm always writing fantasy and i was like oh like i think something about witches would be like really great for this and um actually this kind of ties back to what's your idea of success um and like having to think about what that was like and um you know reaching a point in animation where i had a great job that i was really excited about um and feeling like still like I wanted to create my own stuff made me kind of reevaluate it. And um, I actually came up with the idea for Bad Witches while I was kind of going through that little mini crisis. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, what's it like then to have um, a dream and to realize that in order to live a life that makes you happy, it's not going to include that dream in exactly the way that you thought it would. Um, and I don't want to say too much because we haven't gotten there in Bad Witches yet, but um, Agnes is going to learn about that, basically. Um, so Agnes, the two characters are Agnes and Babathu. Um, and Agnes is a young woman whose greatest desire is to grow up and become an evil witch. And so she wants to apprentice to Babathu, who's the most famous evil witch of all. Um, and she goes, shows up to get an apprenticeship with Babathu. And um, let's just say that it doesn't go exactly like she had expected it to. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so um, Agnes's character arc is going to be um, reimagining what she thought her life would look like and figuring out how to be happy um, with something that maybe wasn't what her idea of success looked like. That's, I, when you told me about the story, <laughs> One of the reasons why I loved it so much is because although this takes place in a world where witches are real and it has a bunch of like comedic elements to it and it's dark, it's fantasy, it's magical, the idea of like having an expectation of something and achieving it always comes with a reevaluating of that expectation. Nothing is ever what you expect it to be ever, ever in life. So I, I <laughs> feel like I resonated with that so much because this is a human experience for everybody you sometimes arrive at a goal that you were so focused on and then when you're there you're like oh <laughs> what is yeah. this you know you, you like question so many things and I yeah. love that you came up with the idea at a point in your life where you were going through the same exact experience which is yeah. just beautiful <laughs> yeah it would just, it's resonated with me. I think it's easy to write something that you feel like close to in the moment. Um, yeah. And I just really wanted to write something about two badass women because <laughs> that's pretty much what I only write about. <laughs> I support that so much. <laughs> that should be the, like the genre, just badass women. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. If I could have gotten away with it, the title of Bad Witches would be bad witches but the w be cost out and be bad bitches <laughs> <laughs> but for a number of reasons that was not a good idea yeah, but i can think of many that's, yeah that's the feeling <laughs> i love it <laughs> and you can you can feel that when reading the story there's like this raunching raunchiness to it and it's yeah it's a, a breath of fresh air for sure in in fantasy specifically i don't think I, we see that as often so another great thing for your story and, yeah. and one of the reasons i hope that people who are listening to the podcast after <laughs> you listen to this whole thing go and read this yeah. story <laughs> i know i've made it sound terribly wholesome but i anyone listening should know that i also just drew eight pages of um fantasy drinking and drugs ending in some wild spell casting so if that doesn't get you 
check out there's a there's a demon daddy's calendar there's a lot of good stuff around the corner amazing <laughs> <laughs> definitely be on the lookout you, you produce so much good quality stuff and people need to pay attention to it um what is your favorite thing about making comics yeah i think definitely so far it's been being able to deliver something directly to an audience that i had every piece of creative control over i'm used to like working my creative pursuits being in teams which is great and you learn a ton um, and there's lots of advantages to it but um, this is the first time i think that my voice has like directly gone to someone reading it um and that is just been really like special and exciting and awesome um, because you know I I don't think you have to write stories to be read but I think the act of storytelling itself is really communication and so to for me to get the most out of that there has to be someone on the other end and right. for the first time there is yeah and it's growing rapidly I'm loving seeing you know all the people <laughs> starting to read it especially because I saw it beforehand right so i knew yes. people would like it i just i was just waiting That's for the great. moment for it to go out and you know it, it was what i expected it to be which is great <laughs> yeah when the first strangers commented i was like who are you do i know you i don't know you you're speaking to me did you read my comic you thought it was so good that you wanted to comment you have things to say about my work <laughs> it's so it's such a nice feeling right because you, you yeah. obviously i think most of us create for ourselves in the first place but there's always that element of, of people connecting to the work that is just one of the reasons why we also like to, to make art. Especially yeah. if you like storytelling, like that's like yes. imperative to storytelling. <laughs> yeah. um, is there anything that you don't like about making comics? Yes, I am gonna get on my fucking business pedestal for you for a minute. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm like recent to the online comic world and um, I don't understand why there isn't a Kindle for comics. Um, I love Webtoons, Webtoons is great, but Webtoons is basically social media for comics. You can get sponsored, but um, I just don't understand why there isn't an online retailer that has enough of the comic market that you could be not only producing stuff and selling stuff through them, but actually reaching people through them. Mm -hmm. Like you can sell PDFs on Gumroad and you can, there's a lot of places that you can get your audience too but i just don't understand why there's not like a kindle for comics and i know that amazon has something but it's not it's, it's not, not ubiquitous same. in that way it's not the same and mm -hmm. i think that's like a really big lost opportunity because i think there's a lot of fantastic independent com comics out there that i would even order issues of after i had read for free um or pay for something like kindle unlimited um yeah. which again i know is kind of similar to webtoons but um the the direct to market selling with webtoons is really limited um, and I am annoyed and angry and surprised that there isn't that kind of a market because I think there's totally the demand for one. Um, so someone who is more techie than me needs to go make it. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think there is something behind that uh, question and anger and I, I definitely resonate with it. So maybe that should be a next project for, oh. for us. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, it, it sounds like mind numbing, but somebody should definitely get on it. And I think that you're right on all accounts. Like there needs to be yeah. that for for people who make comics, who enjoy reading comics, and especially now where we're having this like new golden era of comics, right? Everybody's yeah. reading comics, at least a lot yeah. of people. And why is this not a thing? And you know yeah. what? You're you're right to be upset about it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, but if anyone wants to do it, email me and I will consult with you because I have yes. opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know you said you're like pretty anal, pretty like structured about the way you approach comics in a, in a way that you're also thinking about the business side of things. But um, can you tell me a little bit about what your specific process for making each episode looks like? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the first thing I did before I even started making episodes, um, is I wrote it all down. Um, I find it easier to iterate in words. And so, um, I am working from a plot that has every beat 
listed out for the entirety of the comic. So for me, that's really important for the kind of storytelling that I like to do. Um, I start with character arc, um, and then I build the plot around that to make sure that it's going to be emotionally resonant and feel gratifying as possible. Um, so I have three or four acts, um, and I know what's happening in each one. It's kind of like a mega arc. Um, and so I, I have that kind of like North Star to work with whenever I'm making an episode. Um, and then I'll go in and I'll flesh out a little bit. I'll come up with some jokes and some kind of like pinpoints for like what needs to happen in, uh, in a, like a mini arc basically. Um, and then I, but I'm not too like strict with a script actually. Um, because when I go from script to thumbnail, I find that a lot of stuff you kind of think of or learn along the way because moving from words to visuals is kind of different. So I stay a little loose on the outline of like a specific episode. Um, and so I thumbnail um, and I add all of the dialogue in and I, I usually change quite a bit of the little stuff at that point to make it work a little more smoothly and stuff. And also to make sure that I'm hitting the, the right amount of pages that I can get done um, in two weeks because I definitely overestimated at first like the pacing <laughs> and so now I'm like breaking all of my little plots up into like double plots. Um, right. <laughs> So I thumbnail, um, and then otherwise I pretty much work kind of like storyboards. There's, I think it's a pretty normal pipeline. Um, thumbnail, and then I do roughs, um, and then I do line, and then I do color. Um, and I actually work in page format, so I'm working on print format um, to print those pages out. And I think Webtoons format is really cool. I love the scroll format, but I think some point I'm going to want to print this um, or make it available on Kickstarter or something like that. And so for me, I just knew that like going back and putting something, I've seen people put Webtoon stuff into print form and it's really hard to go backwards. I think it's yes. easier to go the other way around. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I learned that from you guys, um, yeah. <laughs> my um, amazing group, um, but I, I've seen it too actually happen. Um, I picked up, I won't say what it was, but I picked something up in a store that was printed that started on Webtoons and the first book um, it just didn't translate as well yeah, to the it's a rough. <laughs> it's a hard transition. So I wanted to do it the other way around. So mm -hmm. then after I finish a full page, then I copy and paste everything and I rearrange and I sometimes some minor editing is needed into the scroll format. And then I export and then I proofread and then I fix the mistakes and then I proofread again and I fix the other mistakes and then I proofread <laughs> and then I tweak and then I export. <laughs> and then rinse and repeat. <laughs> yeah. 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 Amazing. I, you know, I love that process. I follow a somewhat uh, similar process and just, I feel because comics are this thing where you're translating a story that's written to images, it'll always have an, a little adventure for you along the way that you have to figure yeah. out visually. <laughs> so when you have all your ducks in a row, then it's so much easier to transition and to fix things and rather than I know some mad people who just don't have a process at all. They just like go straight into their episodes and I, you know, all the power to them. It's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> I wish I had that, that uh, level of power and insanity, but I do not. <laughs> like that sounds very stressful. And if you can do it without it being very high stress then mad props, but I feel yeah. like that's maybe not the way this is. <laughs> If you're just getting into comics, I would not recommend that. Yeah. There are people who have done it for so long that they can get away with it, but um, I think that sounds really anxiety-inducing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, talking about people who have done comics for a long time or just artists who are art gods at this point now, um, do you have any, like, big art inspirations that you feel really influence your work? Yeah, so I think that the person who influenced, I would say, like, my whole kind of career in general, um, not so much the animation portion, um, but who I really, whose just whole career I've really admired and would love to be like is um, Ursula Vernon. She's not super well known in the comics world. She's done comics and she's done some kids books, but um, she wrote one of the first web comics I ever read. Um, okay. It's called Digger. Um, and it won a Nebula, I believe. Um, it's really, really good. And uh, I think it's still available for free online for anyone who wants to check it out. It's like kind of hard to find, but it, I know it's free because I've referenced it even kind of recently. Amazing. Um, and she, yeah, she is someone who I just think is so cool because she goes back and forth between um, comics and illustration and um, full length novels. And she's uh, she works in fantasy and she's got a tone um, that 
I think is really unique and cool. Um, she's got kind of a tongue in cheek vibe, a, a wholesome tongue in cheek vibe. Uh, that isn't something that you would necessarily think uh, would be an easy sell, but she does it so well um, that she's drawn a really big audience. Um, and I think she's just really cool and impressive. And also she gardens, <laughs> so I like her. <laughs> so even better, just like another layer of, of liking yeah. them. <laughs> exactly. Well, I don't, I don't think I know them, but I definitely have to check it out. Uh, yeah. Any recommendation for from you? I know I'm gonna like so. Oh, yeah. so sweet. <laughs> yeah, check yeah, it out. <laughs> you should, we should definitely read Digger because it's like a little existential, um, mm-hmm. and I think that you would enjoy it. Right up my alley, you know. You yeah. Know I like my existential. Heck yeah. <laughs> emo stuff. <laughs> but it's like humorous existential, which so. It's Even like, better. It's like it's like if you mashed us up and then like rolled a little ball and then just like sliced it. That's what you would get. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> I already love her. <laughs> And also because I try to make this podcast a place of support, um, are there any like artists that you follow, comic book artists, animators, writers, whoever, that you feel deserve a lot more love than what they get? Well, I've been told that I can't say you, so... (laughs) Yeah, no, it's forbidden. (laughs) Um, I think um, Vampire Librarian. By Emily Cotton is really amazing. Um, I love their work. I find their color palette to be like unbelievably inspiring. Um, and they're they a really good storyteller. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, also, The Witch by Niche the Lich, which is really confusing because if you see it written, it should say Ditch the Lich, but it's not. It's Niche the Lich, <laughs> which I really, I still can't even say it. Um, I always say but... Niche the Leash. I know it's not how yeah. you say it. <laughs> Niche the Lich, um, the witch, um, which I think is really kind of a tonal masterpiece. Um, the the way that they maintain um, maintain their tone and their mood and their vibe while still telling what's really quite like a concretely structured story is really impressive. It is. Um, they yeah. are one of the madmen's who do have a bit of a structure but not as much as as we do and still oh, yeah. they deliver a masterpiece but of an episode every they're single not time. a beginner so. no <laughs> not at all <laughs> um and then i just started this so i actually haven't read the whole thing yet but um the beast of had had uh, the beast of haddingly hill by horatio marissa um has a style that I absolutely love. I think the art is beautiful and amazing and the pacing is really good. Um, Mm -hmm. The way that the storytelling gets told often without words is um, really cool and I love their style. Love when they show and don't tell. That's like a great thing to have for sure. And I don't think I've read it so I'm I'm gonna have to ask you to uh, send me the link because I'm not gonna remember that name. (laughs) Oh yeah, no, I, I don't even know if I said it right so. It is a mouthful. <laughs> That's what it sure. is. Yeah. It's yeah. as beautiful as it is difficult to say. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need to put effort into it. You know, it's like yeah. not simple like that. <laughs> yep. Yep, 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 yep. And to everyone who's listening, probably beginner artists, like what kind of advice would you give to people who follow you that want to become artists themselves, whether it be writers, comic book artists, or even uh, storyboard, storyboard artists or animators? Yeah, I mean, um, definitely what I said before, which is uh, if you spend the time and energy working on your mental health and how to stay stay motivated but also just like be happy because we're not always going to be motivated there be times when you're not as productive but I would blame myself for those times instead of understanding that's just like a natural process of life and creativity you're not at 100 all the time um so I think really like the more effort you can put into that the more you're going to see dividends pay down the road I've seen a lot of people who went really hard and developed some really incredible technical skills in animation burnout Um, and just kind of like lose their joy for it. So it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, And I really think just figuring out how to not judge yourself and support yourself is great. And I'm gonna say something that might be a little controversial. Um, I think that you should get critique, but I think that you should only do it um, sparingly. I think that critique is great and I think that it's an important part of learning, but I think that studying things is should be maybe like 
70% of your learning and critique should be like 10 to 30%. Uh, because what critique is really good for is critique is really good for when you have a specific problem or you need to turn something in really polished that's a short length and you want someone else to help you get it there. Um, or when you're like looking, like when I get critique on my novels, I specifically tell them what areas I'm looking for critique in and what format I want it. Because critique is hard no matter who you are and nobody likes to get it and nobody um, is going to be able to get it without having to process that. And I think a lot of times beginning artists, and I say this as I did it, um, go looking, go into critique looking for validation that they are good. Mm. And I think that you are setting yourself up for failure if you do that. And I think what what critique is great for is specific skill building or trying to get an, in, an animation job, for example. I gave a critique to someone who wants to break into animation recently, and I gave a board critique, which is like notes on a specific board because that imitates what a director would do in the workplace, and that makes sense. You want to do that. And I, again, then I give a big picture of like, this is the general area of drawing that I work on. Your perspective is really good, but this other area is where I would focus your time, and here's some resources for it. Um, but you can't do that all the time. You don't need to do that all the time and everyone's going to have a different opinion. So you shouldn't look for someone to tell you that you're good enough. You should decide that you are good no matter where you are and whether you're getting hired or not. And it, the only place you can do is grow. Um, but don't, don't just be nice to yourself. Just be nice to yourself. You're <laughs> great. You're talented. Yourself. <laughs> you're awesome. And if you ever have trouble remembering it, just pop over and I will remind you. <laughs> you know, I, I love, mean, literally anyone. <laughs> I love how you're like, I'm going to say something controversial. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> no, but I think people really, I think there is a sense of like a little bit of idealization of critique. And there is this idea, and I see it a lot in animation, that like the toughest people who can take the most mm. feedback grow the quickest. And yeah. I actually think that that's a fallacy. Um, that sort that of like seems to me a little bit like when you white knuckle things or like yeah. the, the grind mentality, right? Just yes, like, exactly. Yeah. It's not really helpful to anybody at the end of the day because you're mm -hmm. going to burn yourself out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think it's super valuable advice that you're giving there. Yeah. And literally tag me on Instagram and say, Tanaya Anu, I need a compliment and I will come compliment you. I'm great at compliments. Yes. <laughs> Rarely do people ask for compliments. <laughs> oh, I do. I tell my husband sometimes. I tell him, I look extra good today. I need you to tell me how beautiful I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's sometimes normalize I just tell them exactly what to say. I just think if you if you want it, just ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are your plans for the future? I know that you are very business oriented and you're very structured in the things that you do. So I'm assuming that there is a plan. There are some milestones for the near future in regards to your comic or your work or even your social media presence. So what can you tell us about what can you tell us about that? I won't take you through the one-year plan, the three-year plan, the five-year plan, the 10-year plan, and the 20-year plan, but they do exist. <laughs> okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, I think, you know, comics is like kind of new for me this year. So um, I am going to, I've given myself a year to freelance and um, work on just producing, just making stuff I like, figuring out what I like, making sure that I like working semi-independently. Um, and then working on my novel, um, my second novel, the one I will be hopefully querying by the end of the year. Um, it's a, also a comedy fantasy. It's a workplace comedy fantasy nice. um, about a 30-something-year-old slacker who works like a, a government job making magical training videos for babies. <laughs> 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 um, so working on that and then hopefully querying by the end of the year. Um, but I think for me, it's just the goal for the next like couple of years is to just put stuff out there and make sure that I'm being really regular and, um, good about putting content out there. And then, um, if I, if, if querying doesn't go well, or if it does go well, um, I would like to be a hybrid author. Okay. Um, and so to have some traditionally published works and some self-published work, because I really like the idea of the full creative control that comes along with self-publishing. And I do quite like researching things and um, learning new things. So I think learning about advertising and publishing would be really fun for me, but um, trying to break it all into bite-sized pieces. So being a lot more regular about my social media presence, making sure I'm getting on out there. This is like the year of having people get eyes on me. Um, <laughs> and then next year, I think probably it's going to be easier to monetize books than comics. And at the end of the day, like we all need money. Like we all think about that. Um, but I think the comics is going to be 
maybe a process of exploring a Kickstarter or figuring out um, what the best place to sell direct is, either PDFs or books or something. Um, but I think it's a lot more clear cut in publishing than it is in comics. And so, yeah. So <laughs> when that listener has created that site that is the Kindle for comics, I will be the first one there. We'll go there <laughs> <laughs> together, be like, we yeah. made this happen. <laughs> The promised land. <laughs> I love I love it because I what I feel I get the most out of all the things you've shared is that you are very ambitious. You're very um you know what you want and you know what you want to do to get it, but at the same time you have this balance of mindfulness, right? And like checking up with yourself and being kind to yourself and I think those two things are very positive and like taking the best out of those two attributes, right? Just mindfulness and being ambitious yeah yeah practicality i like to say yes. i'm ruthlessly practical amazing <laughs> and you know what if you're truly ruthlessly practical you will spend time on things that improve your mental health because it's the foundation for everything else so just ruthless practicality all of them <laughs> <laughs> spoken like a wise woman <laughs> i don't know about that but <laughs> and finally my favorite question The one I always leave for the end of every episode. And actually, like, super fitting to your comic is if you could have any magical art power to help you in your artistic process, what would you like that to be? You know, I think, and this is so woo-woo, but um, you can always want more. There's always something to want. And so I'm at the place in my life where I'm trying to be happy with what I have. And so... The answer would be none, because I really like what I have right now. Um, but I think it's also like one of the reasons like I love fantasy is because I grew up wanting to like escape into it. And I think for a lot of people, it's like an outlet and escape. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of why I now write kind of grounded fantasy that's a little like, like all my fantasy kind of has a thread of like, <laughs> this is fantasy, but I'm not going to give you the the magical power trip that you came for. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of like the same thing that like my own process and like growing up has been, which is like, I don't, I don't, I don't need that escape anymore. Um, I think the, this life can be as magical as we want it to. That's incredible. Although I'll say, <laughs> how dare you do this to me when you're writing a, a comic about witches and magic and you're like, I, I don't want, I don't want any magical art power. <laughs> I know. But I think if you read the comic that you will find that Babathu is basically a cautionary tale. Okay. For well. having all the magical powers in the world and it still doesn't make you happy. <laughs> I love that. Although, okay, let's, let's do this. Like, Hypothetically, though, because <laughs> this is gonna like, like, let's say you, you know, like magic is real, and it doesn't have yeah. to be like helpful for every aspect of the art process. But like, just yeah. one thing, you can be like, maybe I don't have any lower back pain from drawing ten hours a day. That's a magical art power. <laughs> That lower back pain is there to tell me not to draw ten hours a day because ten hours a day is too much. <laughs> Damn it, you're right. <laughs> But wait, let me think of, uh, I want money. <laughs> money is basically <laughs> magic. And if I could pay someone else to do my lettering, I would. <laughs> I think I mean, hand lettering yes. looks amazing and I don't have the patience for it. Oh, me neither. I, it's one of the things that is definitely not a strong suit for me. Uh, but no. I think you do a great work, great job at it. Uh, your comic 100% solid on all aspects for me personally. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> well, I have a lot of dialogue, so if I hand lettered, that would be a real commitment. So, oh my God, again, yes. rather rather have it done than great. But sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. I seem like I'm being like horribly stubborn, and maybe I am, but also I just <laughs> I don't have a good answer. <laughs> no, it's it's very fitting. It's very fitting. <laughs> <laughs> a little annoying but very fitting <laughs> no nah, nah, nah. no it's it's actually it's fun because it, a lot of people answer different things but there are always like similar answers sometimes to the question so it, it is uh, a breath of fresh air that you don't want any <laughs> magical art power but it is ironic because you're writing about fantasy <laughs> yeah it's like if you'd asked me what my favorite color was i would have been like i can't answer this question oh <laughs> i just don't do favorites i just yeah. i can't do it <laughs> you just can't have favorites there and you know what no fair except arian arian is my favorite That's just like objective <laughs> <laughs> that's too sweet 
I guess you know what and we're gonna end on a compliment for me so that seems yeah. fitting to me <laughs> we definitely should 100 <laughs>